Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Samantha, and I will be your MC today. Welcome to the Singapore Perspectives Conference 2023, organized by the Institute of Policy Studies. We are very pleased to have you join us this morning. Before I begin, here are a few administrative announcements. For the question and answer sessions, please submit your questions on the online platform. You can do this at any time during the event. Kindly raise your questions in a constructive and respectful manner. We will be posting highlights of our discussions today on Twitter, Facebook, LinkedIn, and Instagram. If you are doing the same on your social media accounts, please use our conference hashtag SP2023WORK. Today's program will begin with opening remarks by Dr. Chu Han Yi, Senior Research Fellow at the Institute of Policy Studies. It will be followed by a keynote speech by Minister Chan Chun Singh, Minister for Education. The subsequent Q&A session with Min Chan will be moderated by Ms. Priscilla Yong. Ms. Yong has served close to two decades in the public service and was previously with the Institute for Adult Learning, where she led the design, program business development, and marketing functions. We hope you will enjoy the program. May I now invite Dr. Chu for the opening remarks. Dr. Chu, please. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Singapore Perspectives 2023 work. I'm honored to be here today to address this important topic, which is a key concern for businesses, governments, and individuals around the world. As we all know, the world of work is undergoing a period of rapid change and transformation. Advances in technology, shifts in global economic power, and changing demographics are all having a profound impact on the way we work and the nature of work itself. And if you thought that was an unusual opening to IPS's flagship conference, that's because I was trying to sound like a robot, reading a speech on the future of work that has been generated by the AI tool ChatGBT, that is supposedly the next big thing in tech. So this year, I may have a job as uh, the conference chair. Maybe in a couple of years, you'll be an avatar greeting you. The point I'm making is that the future of work is upon us just as many conferences on the future of work have been telling us. What makes Singapore Perspectives 2023 different is that we are gathered here to search our hearts and minds for how we can achieve the best possible future of work for Singapore and Singaporeans. The conference is structured around three themes that underlie this core question. Today, we will examine how to adapt and succeed in the future of work. Next Monday, we will question how to succeed together. On the 16th at MBS, we will weigh how to balance the aspirations of different groups of Singaporeans and revitalize our social compact. We are honored today to have Minister for Education, Mr. Chan Chun Singh, to launch the conference with his keynote speech on the future of education. Mr. Chan was appointed Singapore's Minister for Education in 2021, and is also the Minister in Charge of the Public Service. He was previously Minister for Trade and Industry and responsible for driving Singapore's economic and industrial development. He was also Deputy Chairman of the People's Association, where he oversaw national efforts to foster social cohesion. Mr Chan's earlier appointments included Minister in the Prime Minister's Office and SecGen of NTUC. At NTUC, he expanded the Labour mo Movement Network to represent all working people in Singapore. Minister, please. A very good morning to all of you, and Happy New Year. First, let me thank IPS for this invitation to share our perspective on the future of education. Before I assumed my appointment as the Minister for Education, I sought advice from several of my predecessors. One of the sagely pieces of advice shared with me, which I took to heart, was this. Whatever good that happens during my time as Education Minister, I should be quick to give thanks to my predecessors. 
Whatever bad that happens after my time as Education Minister, I should be even quicker to take responsibility. Indeed, education is a long-term endeavour. There is a Chinese saying, 十年树木, 百年树人. 10 years to grow a tree, a lifetime to nurture a person. Good outcomes for education come not just from the result of good policies, but also, very importantly, consistent application with conviction. Today, I will outline the challenges and opportunities that confront us and the urgency for action. Our vision of how the various pieces of education fit together, and most importantly, how we intend to realise this vision together, starting now. Any education system, to be relevant to the times, must deeply understand and adapt to the forces that shape our world, our society, and very importantly, the nature of work. And we do this not just for the next few years, but also for the next generation. With that, let me start with our macro environment. We will face a more connected, yet fragmented world. Our people must master the skill sets and possess the mindsets to operate in such an environment. We will be more connected across the digital, physical and production domains, yet more fragmented on the geopolitical, trade, technology and ideological fronts. We must also expect digital connectivity to continue to grow, shaping and reshaping the way we live, produce, transact and interact. The combination of increased physical and virtual connectivity will allow people and nations who can master them to have the edge in attracting talent and investments, seeking creativity, efficiency and resilience. Yet this will also be a more troubled and fragmented world. A world divided by geopolitics as major powers contest, compete and hopefully not end up in physical conflict a world lacking the rules-based institutions and order necessary to manage the evolving power relations and to cooperate to meet emerging global challenges. It will be a world with heightened uncertainties, insecurities and inequalities. Heightened uncertainties not just from the forces reshaping the relationships of the big powers, but also from the actions of these powers in response to the shifts. Heightened insecurities as countries try to maintain their absolute and relative power position on the global totem pole. Heightened insecurities, if not the sense of inadequacies, as people become more aware of what others have and what they may not have. Heightened inequalities across nations and within nations as there will be new winners and losers in the transition of global geopolitical power, economic health, clean energy supply and digital connectivity. Domestically, in our society, three sets of forces will shape our future. First, our society will become even more diverse in terms of backgrounds and aspirations. We must learn to manage this and seize the opportunities that come with it. Similar to the challenge of many mature societies and global cities, the more we are unable to reproduce ourselves, the greater our challenge to integrate more non-local born citizens into our social fabric at scale and at speed in order to sustain our economic vibrance and social cohesion. On the other hand, the more we are connected and integrated with the global economy as our lifeline, the more we will need to deeply understand others and be able to operate seamlessly across borders, cultures and political systems. For Singapore, managing diversity and being able to connect and collaborate are essentials and not options. Second, the more integrated Singapore is with the world as our hinterland and market, the greater the competitive pressures our people will face. Our task is not to pretend that we can shield ourselves from competition. Instead, our task is to enable our people to thrive in this ever more competitive environment. To this end, like everyone else, we will need to counter the tendencies to turn insular, nativist, and retreat into our own echo chambers. The skills to discover, distill, and discern 
in an information overloaded world are critical. The interest and discipline to connect across and beyond our own comfort zones is a competitive advantage. Third, on the domestic front, the longer and more successful we are as a country, the greater our risk of us seeing the world as we want it rather than as it is. Or that the government can somehow insulate us from the harsh realities of the world beyond Singapore. This will threaten our ability to remain relevant and make a living through connecting with the world. Hence, a critical part of our education system will be to understand the world as it is. Turning now to the future of work, let me share a story. In my time with NTUC and then MTI, I had the chance to visit many companies. Even prior to COVID, for greater efficiencies, meetings with local and overseas counterparts were already increasingly conducted virtually. I have seen work done in Singapore, handed over at close of our business day to Europe, which was then handed to America before coming back to Singapore in a 24-hour cycle. Work is increasingly defined by the three Ds, digital, disruption, and what I call connected dispersion. I will not need to elaborate on the digital dimension as we are familiar with its power and ubiquity. The ability to master these digital skills will define our competitiveness as individuals, companies, and countries. The intertwined technological and business cycles will continue to compress in time and space. The shelf lives of ideas, products, companies, and very importantly, jobs, will continue to shrink from decades to years and potentially less. More frequent disruptions mean we must remove the artificial boundaries between earning and learning for adults. Both must occur concurrently and throughout life. Digital connectivity has accelerated the trend and enhanced the potential of remote work. Hence, connected dispersion is the new norm. The ability to connect and harness the global talent pool instead of the domestic talent pool alone will define our competitiveness. Therefore, our real focus is not how many locals versus foreigners we have in Singapore. Instead, it is about how many talented Singaporeans and non-Singaporeans we can harness from across the world to compete for Team Singapore. On the other hand, we can also expect more work to be done asynchronously. The lifestyles and aspirations of the new generations will reinforce this trend. So long as people can connect anywhere and anytime, work will increasingly be done anywhere and anytime. This requires a mindset shift in how we organise working and learning from young. The ability to learn and work in both structured environments and asynchronous decentralised contexts. It is not one or the other, but both. With what I have laid out as our backdrop, the urgency for our education system to evolve at speed is clear. Let me now describe the outcomes we want our education system to deliver for the future, starting now. At the individual level, we must be curious, collaborative, confident, contributing, and continuously learning throughout life. At the industry level, we must be connected and competitive. At the societal level, we must be cohesive and compassionate. Curiosity is the substrate of creativity and in turn value add. Knowledge is increasingly commoditized. Our benchmark for success is not how able we are to apply yesterday's solutions to today's problems. Instead, it is how able we are to anticipate and frame tomorrow's challenges, develop timely and relevant solutions to create new value for a more uncertain world. While it is said that we cannot teach curiosity or creativity, we must certainly not diminish them through road learning, distracted by chasing the marginal last mark and chasing after the same narrow definition of success. Collaboration must be our strength as we must never believe in our ability to achieve alone. Singaporeans must distinguish ourselves as a team rather than as a collection of individuals. 
collaboration must span disciplines, cultures and geography. The ability to connect and bridge divides must be our defining characteristic, to value add to a fragmenting and fractious world. Confidence in our respective abilities and respect for our diverse strengths will make us a more cohesive and compassionate society. We must build a culture of celebrating and nurturing diversity to bring out the best in every child to strengthen our collective resilience. And if we truly believe in nurturing resilience and building confidence in our young people to face an uncertain and untidy world, we must also be careful to not overstructure, overprovide, or overprotect our younger generation, which would deprive them of the opportunities to grow and learn. Our people must deeply understand the world as it is and learn how to navigate the uncertainties and untidiness from young. At the industry level, our education system must also help our companies connect better and evolve faster to stay competitive. If our competitiveness comes from our ability to connect across geography, geopolitics and culture, then our education system must similarly produce individuals and teams that can do this. This is the reason why we are investing so heavily to expose our students to the world beyond Singapore. Notwithstanding the COVID disruptions, we will renew our push to send more of our students overseas for exposure and more of them to the less trodden paths. This is also the reason why we want our students to grow up with friends from overseas while they are in school. Having foreign counterparts in our institutions add to our learning and diversity. And finally, at the societal level, Singaporeans must distinguish ourselves by having the cohesion to move fast and together against the forces that threaten to fragment us. And we can only remain successful if we continue to have generations of Singaporeans who understand that success is a team sport and everyone has the responsibility to pay it forward. We are all here not just because of our hard work and intelligence, but because of the opportunities provided by our system and our predecessors. As such, it is integral for the more successful, the more talented, and the better end up to take care of those with less. Our definition of success must go beyond how much we achieve for ourselves to how much we contribute to others and the larger good. That will be the mark of true distinction as a Singapore rent. Redistributive fiscal policies alone will not mitigate the widening inequalities in an uncertain and insecure world. We must couple that with a societal ethos to lean forward, to provide more opportunities and access to those who may be less privileged. Help them build the networks and ties. Assure every Singaporean that there will be an outstretched hand to help regardless of one starting point. And now, for our education system to deliver all this for us, we will focus on five key shifts. First, beyond mass access to mass customization. Second, beyond defining success for the first 15 years to the next 50 years. Third, beyond an academic industry partnership to an intertwined relationship. Fourth, beyond the efforts of MOE to the efforts of the whole society. And fifth, investing in the lifelong learning and innovation of our teaching fraternity. Let me start with the first, from mass access to mass customization. We have built up a strong basic system that has enabled mass access to quality education. And our efforts to support and equip each Singaporean will continue. But we must not be carried away by success and fail to check our blind spots or to chase perfection at the risk of irrelevance. For mass customization, we need to do three things better. First, we need stronger investment in the early years, especially for the less privileged children of families with higher needs. Now, this is particularly important as there's increasing evidence that we must not allow the learning and development gap to widen from young. Once the development gap sets in, the amount of remediation required is inordinately high and it becomes difficult to rectify. We have done much in the last 15 years, 
and we will want to do more going forward, particularly for the high-needs family and the high-needs children. We will examine afresh new ways to reach out to these children and families, how to structure the support for them holistically, including both education and social together, so that no one is left behind at the start. And we welcome partnerships with a wider range of people and private organisations to pilot new models to do this, both at scale and the, with the appropriate diversity to meet the differing needs. The second aspect of customization is that we will need to embrace more adaptive learning technologies and pedagogies enabled by data to bring out the best in each child. Mass customization must allow us the ability to stretch the top while freeing resources to uplift the disadvantage. Artificial intelligence and deep analytics technologies must enable us to relook at our pedagogies to see how we can mass, mass customize even better. That even before the student come into class, the data will allow us to focus the curriculum necessary and targeted to the respective individuals. And the third part of this mass customization is that we must continue to diversify the pathway of success for our students. Diversity of choices for subjects, greater flexibility in subject levels through full subject-based banding, and customizing of even degree programs. These are but some examples of how we intend to further mass customize our system to bring out the best in our people. With that, we will also need to broaden and yet be more targeted in the way we enable students to select their pathways and subjects of study. A good selection and posting system cannot rely on a narrow, single dimension or a single point in time evaluation of the complex and diverse strengths and skills of an individual. We must continue to have a broad and continuous meritocracy and not allow our system to degenerate into one of credentialism aptitude-based admission and direct school admission based on real potential and interest will be a greater part of our more diverse selection and placement system. And I think all of us will agree, a more diverse and variegated education system will better serve our needs, but it will also require a mindset and cultural shift away from the incessant desire to compare and benchmark students and institutions. That brings me to the second shift that we need. Defining success beyond the first 15 years in school to also the next 50 years beyond school. Given the disruptions expected, no amount of front-loading will ever be sufficient to prepare our people for life. Instead, the first 15 years must build the foundations upon which learning continues for the next 50 years. The spirit of inquiry, the desire to create new knowledge and value, the ability to discover, discern and distill. These are our new competencies and benchmark for success. To achieve lifelong learning, besides the shift in individual attitudes, we must also relook at industry practices and institutional capabilities. Our industry cannot and must not passively wait for the perfect worker to be developed for them. Instead, Industry must be an active partner to shape our students' interests and skill sets even before the student in school becomes a worker in industry. This is why I encourage corporate leaders and captains of industry to go into the school, join the school advisory boards, support their applied learning programs, speak with the student, inspire them, and paint them the exciting future that awaits them. Industry must also work with academia to keep training their workers even after they join the workforce. But I can understand the difficulties in committing to training workers given the uncertainties and disruptions in the industries. But the more we don't do this well and together as a system, the more we end up poaching from one another in a stagnant talent pool. Our institutions also need to redesign the andragogies to meet the needs of our adult learners and enable them to learn anything, anywhere, anytime. Amidst their competing family and financial responsibilities. And the new andragogies will be much more challenging than the pedagogies. The pedagogies for 
a few cohorts in school is a challenge. The andragogies for many more cohorts of adult learners will be an even bigger challenge. And we will be reviewing the way we fund and support lifelong education. Specifically, how we can structure our system better to give our mid-career individuals a boost to remain relevant and competitive. Elements of this will include how we can better guide and inform our people of the challenges and opportunities ahead, not just generally, but specifically to counsel mid-career workers whose careers are at risk ahead of time. How we can help our adult learners defray the opportunity cost of continuing to learn as they juggle their family and financial responsibilities. How we can collectively help smoothen the more frequent transitions in and out of work combined with the acquisition of new skills ahead of and in between transitions. We can look forward to some of these ideas from our Forward Singapore deliberations. Our third shift is the way we need to tighten the nexus between frontier industry and academia. While we cannot outcompete others on scale, we can certainly be pioneers at the intersections of conventional disciplines to create new value. Our goal is not to have interdisciplinarity in every individual. Instead, our goal is to be adept at forming interdisciplinary teams across students and faculties to create new value. But this is hard work, required of our institutions and faculties. It requires the skill sets to collaborate with others beyond our disciplines and comfort zone. In the research, innovation and enterprise cycle, we have generally done better for research and less so for the parts on innovation and enterprise. And we certainly need to do better to translate research into enterprises. And we will have to review the way we organise ourselves and incentive structure for our RIE institutions to do this better. Working across boundaries like our interdisciplinary research centres of excellence such as the Mechano Biology Institute and the Singapore Centre for Environmental Life Sciences Engineering are examples of how we can do this well. Beyond our universities, our industries and polytechnics and ITE also need to strengthen the partnership to interest and tools and inspire the next generation. When industry and academia co-design and co-develop and co-deliver the pre-employment and continuing education modules for both students and adult learners, we refresh the skills of our people much faster. Work study degrees and diplomas will become more common as part of our effort to expand the involvement of industry players in co-delivering skills training. We must similarly design our system for greater porosity and synergy between academia and industry to enhance the flow of frontier research and industry practices between our industries and learners. These are the reasons why we are pushing for more and tighter industry academia tied up at all levels. The fourth shift we need is to partner and leverage the diverse strengths of our society and refresh at speed our perspectives on success. MOE has never believed that we can ever change society or even develop the next generation alone. To truly enhance the diversity of strengths and broaden our definition of success, we must work with parents, community partners and industries. Otherwise, whatever MOE preaches and practices will be undone. And this is why we are rallying the parent support groups, community partners, industry leaders to join us and our schools. We need to build a culture that truly appreciates the character and gifts of our diverse learners. Success is everyone doing justice to our blessings, rather than everyone chasing after the same yardstick. We must also work with our industry to close the skills gap and remunerate according to contributions rather than just credentials. If we do not collectively narrow the remuneration gap between graduates and non-graduates, diploma holders and non-diploma holders, no amount of preaching the multiple pathway of success will ever work. The diversity of our education fraternity is but a fraction of the diversity of our world and society. We need to leverage the strengths, skills and perspective of our entire society to sharpen the perspective of our next generation. Without their partnership and support, our speed of change will occur in generation time rather than years. Finally, I want to touch on the 
most important shift that will enable all this to happen. And that is the way we equip and organize our teaching faculty. Our educators are delivering much more now. Beyond transmitting knowledge, they are facilitators of discovery and learning. Beyond academics, they provide emotional support for our students and families with higher needs. Beyond engaging mainstream students, they have to continue to reach out and nurture students with special education needs. Beyond mastering the tried and tested pedagogies, they now have to explore and develop new pedagogies and andragogies to deliver blended learning. All these will require new skill sets which similarly cannot be front-loaded. As our educators give their all to take care of our learners, we must also continuously upskill and reskill them. We will also need to find ways to expose our educators to the world beyond the education system for them to better understand the changes taking place around us while bringing back new perspective to their teaching methods. And this is the reason for the Teacher Work Attachment Plus program. Beyond the school system, another area of focus for me is the pedagogical skills of our faculty in our institutes of higher learning or what I call our institutes of continuous learning. We must not leave to chance the teaching abilities and pedagogical and andragogical practices of our faculties in our institutes of continuous learning. And this is why we will step up the investment, research and training of our faculties. This is also why I want our Institute of Adult Learning to be the third pillar of our teaching fraternity's professional development. In addition to NIE and NIEC, looking after our school and preschool educators respectively. Running institutes of higher learning today also requires our leadership teams to have a diversity of skill sets from research to teaching to administration of complex faculty and financial matters. Hence, we will also need to similarly broaden the definition of success for our faculties in our IHLs. The research path is but one path to success. There must be complementary teaching and leadership paths. There should not be any preclusion of those outside the research track from taking on the leadership of our higher education institutions. Now, let me conclude with a story and an observation. Some time back, in a discussion on the future of higher education, I met a distinguished and learned academic who reminded the audience that universities are amongst the longest surviving secular institutions in the world. What was unsaid and perhaps left to the imagination was whether there was a need to change at all. I have no doubt that universities will continue to survive. Our bigger challenge and goal for our universities and education system alike is delivering to their fullest potential. Neither our university nor education system has been, is, or should be static across time. Education 1.0, if you like, was selective in access and specialised in scope. It caters to the privileged, perhaps the elite aristocracy, and was largely specialised in its functions, perhaps to govern, to transmit culture, or to perform rituals. This lasted for the greater part of human civilization. Education 2.0 came about with the industry revolution, where the need for trained labour broadened access to education. But that was still largely specialised in scope to fulfil the traits of the day. Education 3.0, near universal access to education with broad-based curriculum, is still a work in progress for many parts of the world. And this is a more recent 20th century phenomenon where more governments were able to organise the resources to provide mass access. Now, Education 4.0, must equip our people to thrive in a more uncertain, more insecure, more unequal, fragmented, diverse, and more competitive world. Yet a world that is more connected, with more opportunities for those who can bridge divides, keep their cohesion, embrace diversity, and resilience. To achieve this, we must change. We must not see education as for only 15 years up front, but also to be inclusive of the early years and the next 50 years. We must change and broaden the definition of meritocracy to embrace diverse strengths and skills and improve the porosity of pathways to success throughout life. 
we must change and go beyond the transmission of knowledge to the discovery of new knowledge by all and to create new ideas and products to improve the lives for more. And we in Singapore must see education as a collective endeavour of MOEs in partnership with families, community and industries. Finally, we must continuously evolve the way we train, equip, organise our educational fraternity to deliver, especially for the adult learners. However, what will and must not change is our commitment to build the best system possible to enable future generations of Singaporeans to do even better than this generation. What will also not change is our goal to distinguish ourselves as a nation that defines success, not just by our achievements, but also by our contributions. On that note, I look forward to the partnership with you and to hear your ideas and feedback on how we can work together to keep improving our education system in service of our people and nation. Thank you. Thank you, Minister. We will now start our Q&A session with Min Chan, moderated by Ms. Priscilla Yong. To our online audience, please submit your questions via the Q&A panel that appears on the right side of your screen on your computers or at the bottom of the screen for mobile devices. Hi, good morning, Minister. Good morning, Thank Christine. you for sharing your thoughts with us on the future of work as well as education. Right? I'm sure this has struck uh, quite a few chords with, uh, with us and with uh, our participants who are joining us virtually. Right? So we'll, I'll kickstart our Q&A with a question. Uh, you, you mentioned about the key shifts right, that the education system uh, will focus on and also some of the structures that will be implemented to you know, ensure that um, we will be able to work towards this vision. Now, uh, a pressing question of mine is, um, how you know, will we be able to um, you know, work with the, the shifts, you know? I mean, shifts that you laid out, but what about the mindset shifts from, say, even students or, or parents or educators, employers? You know, how, how do we work towards that? Thank you, Priscilla. Indeed, you know, in MOE, I've always said that it's always easier to change structures, processes, and policies. But what is most difficult to change, but most important to change, is that of a mindset. Yeah. And if we look at the mindset, we can divide it into three buckets of mindset. The mindsets of the individuals, the industries, and the institutions. So let me start with the individuals. I think by and large, Singaporeans, I'm very confident, Singaporeans are very practical people. Singaporeans know that they need to be reskilled and upskilled continuously. I have confidence that that message has gone through. What is important and what they want to know is how can they do all this while they juggle their family and financial responsibilities? And this is why, from the government perspective, we want to see how we can work with our industries and our institutions to enable our people to keep learning. Some of the things that we are looking at includes the following. First, how do we build on what the individual has already acquired? We can imagine a system whereby the individual has, if you like, a skills passport, whereby they can, we can know as a system what they have learned and what are the gaps that they need in order to transit to a new career. And in a very targeted way, give them the support to acquire the skills in those areas. So this is what we need to do enabled by data. And I think technology can allow us to do this. Because in today's world, not many people are looking at general degrees and diplomas, but they are looking at skill sets, especially for adults. So I think the first mindset shift required for the individual goes beyond just lifelong learning. It's about having that sense of urgency to be very targeted in knowing what needs to be acquired in order for us to be, continue to be relevant. Now, the second mindset shift that you talked about actually applies to industry. We must move away from this concept that somehow there will be a perfect worker out there with all the necessary skill sets 
ready to go from day one. Instead, we must embrace this mindset that the worker needs to be continuously upgraded. Even the so-called perfect worker today may require to be rescued tomorrow. And this must be a joint partnership between the individual and the industry. Because as I mentioned in my speech, we can't keep looking elsewhere for the perfect worker while forgetting that we need to train our workers. But this is hard because in an industry, given the more frequent disruptions, it's more difficult for people to want to invest in the training of their workers, fearing that they might be poached. But if we all think like that, then we will always end up with the stagnant talent pool. But the third part of the mindset shift, very importantly, is how our institutions deliver those modules, how we design the micro-credentials, the stackable modules that allow people to acquire skills at scale and at speed in a timely manner. It requires us to redesign our pedagogies because very often we use the word adult learners very generally. But adult learners comprises, comprise of people from the 20s to the 30s, 40s, and even the 60s. So what we need to do is to make sure that even with the same subject content, delivering to the person in his 20s or her 20s versus the person in the 60s or 70s even, will be quite a different approach. And this is why we need to strengthen the research on how we can more effectively use different platforms, channels, how we can design the content differently so that we can appeal and attract different learners from different age groups. So that mindset shift is not just about the individual, but it's also about the individual, the industry and the institutions. Thank you, Minister, um, for highlighting you know, and, and really uh, putting out uh, you know, the three um, segments that we should uh, be looking at. Um, we, have a question, we have our questions streaming in from our virtual audience. And uh, I'd like to bring you back to right from the beginning. Uh, we have a question from Mr. Paul Tambia uh, from the Singapore Democratic Party as well as uh, National University Hospital. He's asking if, uh, you know, if you would consider nationalizing preschools right from the start, right? So that uh, we will level the playing field for our very young children, uh, regardless of their backgrounds. Yeah. The real question is not whether we nationalize the preschool or not nationalize the preschool. Today, we are working towards the target where the bulk of our preschool is supported by the government directly or indirectly. We have a plethora of models. We have the MK system in the school. We also have some of the anchor operator schemes, including uh, PCF, NTUC, uh, and three others anchor operators. Then we have the partner operator scheme. And we have considered this issue very deeply. In the early years, particularly, we should not have a one-size-fit-all model. What we need is a diversity of models that cater to the diverse learning needs of our children at that young age. But what we want to do and focus our efforts is to strengthen the efforts that we put in for the higher needs students, or higher needs children from the high needs family. So it's not a one size fits all. That's why it goes back to the theme of mass customization. Uh, if nationalization of preschool, as suggested by Paul, seems to suggest a uniform monolithic model, then I don't think that is the way that we are going forward. In fact, since my time in MSF till my time in MOE now, I'm very acutely aware of the diversity of learning profiles and needs of our students and we need to apply in context the different models. That is what we need to do. How we fund the diversity of models is a separate conversation. That, from today's experience, you can have government funding but even with government funding, it doesn't mean the same model. It means a diversity of models to cater to the needs of our early learners. And one of the things that I want to do much better for our society is not whether we nationalise or not nationalise. It's the handshake between the preschool and the primary schools so that we have a seamless experience. Whatever that is inculcated and taught in the preschool, we build upon them in the primary school. And that will give us better outcome overall. 
Thank you, Minister. And speaking of primary schools, you know, another question that came in from Mr. Uh, Nicholas Elchin is about you know exams, right? So you spoke about uh, mass. Um, you, you spoke about uh, specialization. You spoke about you know embracing diversity, and you know, and his his, his question is, um, right? That uh, many would argue that exam focused education systems cannot prioritize these attributes, and uh, I understand that MOE has started to move away from a lot of emphasis on on exams. Um, but still, we go back to that mindset, right? That uh, you know, it's something that we're familiar with. Uh, it's something that uh, uh, educators or you know, employers look at. So uh, we would need new markers of success and to move away from that single point of uh, assessment. So will we be accelerating uh, the move away from uh, summative exams? Well, I have said this in Parliament before and I'll share this again. There's a role for exams, but we must be clear what is the purpose of any test or examinations. Because if we are not clear with the purpose of our tests and examinations, then no matter what system of exams or tests we have, we will get back into the same problem. Conventionally, many people see exam as a way of a sorting mechanism, if you like, a way to sort people to different uh, paths and so forth. But actually, the more appropriate way to look at exam is that this is a self-evaluation for an individual to understand his or her own strengths and weaknesses. And at the same time, it allows the system to apply the necessary resources to support the next phase of the individual's learning. It is not so much to sort people according to different abilities and so forth. Even if we do that, it is to apply the appropriate resources and teaching pedagogies to best support them. We know some people learn faster, some people learn slower. We know that there are early bloomers, we know that there are late bloomers. What we want is to make sure that we know at any stage in time where the person is and how we can apply the resources appropriately to help them succeed in the next phase. Now, if you take a look at that, uh, from what I say about adaptive learning enabled by technology, increasingly in some of our polytechnics, you are able already to do this. You attend a class online, you do a quiz, we get the feedback, we know where you stand. When you come back to class, we don't go through all the material as if nothing has been done before. Instead, we use the time properly in a very focused and targeted manner to help the class and individuals to improve on those areas they are weak at. Those areas that are really strong and doing well, we can leave that aside for, for the time being. So exams is a way for us to understand where we stand and how we can help the learner in the next phase. But that it requires a cultural shift, a cultural shift that is incessantly comparing one with the others. And if we as parents and as educators truly believe that our job is to bring out the best in every individual, then our benchmark of success is not whether an individual has done well relative to someone else, but it's whether this person has done well relative to himself and his past performance. Which is why I always encourage our students with this saying, it is more important to keep surpassing yourself throughout life than to keep, try and surpass someone else at a point in life called an exam. The surpassing yourself throughout life, learning throughout life, improving throughout life, that is the real goal that we must embrace. Yeah, I totally agree with that. It, it resonates well with me as well because you know we, we shouldn't see exams or we should move away from exams being that kind of um, you know as a, a point in time or as that uh, competition. Uh, rather, you know, if we're looking at the next uh, um, few decades of your life, right? And that's the part where you keep uh, constantly improving. And we can. Yeah. I mean, Chinese New Year is coming. We yeah. can all do our part to encourage. For a start, <laughs> we suggest that you know how we start a conversation with the cousin the children that we meet. It would be nice if, for Chinese New Year, we start the conversation by asking the child, what interests you? Do you know what are your strengths and weaknesses? How do you intend to build on your strengths and weaknesses? Or how do you intend to further your interests? I think this encourages the child to recognize their own strengths and weaknesses and to develop for life. 
Instead of asking the child, what do you score relative to someone else? Where did you get posted to relative to someone else? And as parents and as educators, as a community, we all have the responsibility to affirm our children. I always tell the children that I meet that regardless of their scores in any exams, I want them to know their strengths and weaknesses. I want, them to, I want to see the sparkle in their eye because they look forward to learning. They know where they, are, where they stand, they know what are their strengths and weaknesses, they understand their interests and they have the passion to keep improving. To me, that is more important than any particular grade in any point in life. And not because uh, my mom or my dad asked me to do this, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay, so that, uh, you know, a note to self that um, what, what you should be asking during Chinese New Year uh, when you meet your relatives. Okay, this brings us, I mean, I, uh, in the interest of time, this brings us to our final question that we can take today. Um, we have a question from uh, Mr. Uh, Zainu Rashid, uh, who was former uh, senior minister of state and current ambassador to Kuwait. Right, his question is, how do you see progress made on the social cohesion front from both the perspectives on income, race, ethnicity, uh, and between the two, which is more challenging? This is an evergreen challenge for all societies. The more mature the society, the greater the dangers of stratifications because people generally marry amongst their circle of friends. People get to know people they work with. And so after a while, there will be segregation, which is why in Singapore, we have to continuously lean against such natural forces, if you like, to make sure that our society is one whereby, regardless of your starting point in life, so long as you work hard, so long as you have the capabilities, we will support you and enable you to achieve your full potential. But that must also be coupled with the ethos that if I have succeeded, I must understand that it is also my responsibility to pay it forward and not think that my success is just due to my own hard work and intelligence alone without appreciating the support and opportunities given to me by society. Over time, and that's why I, in my speech I emphasize this, over time we need to put more and more resources to help those that are relatively behind us. And in Singapore, we are quite proud to say that on an absolute level, we have done very well. The bottom 20% of our learners is above the average of the OECD. So by that scale, we have done well. But of course, we, want to, we are not going to cap the top. We just want to keep uplifting the bottom. And we will continue to do so, even though uh, we have done well on an absolute scale. And that is because we want generally everybody to have the sense that they are moving together so that we can keep that social cohesion. But the other part of the social cohesion is that now we are being pulled in different directions by the forces from all around the world because we are such an open and connected society. Now that requires us to develop the skills from young to discover, distill and discern so that we can make up our mind as a society the direction we will go forward together rather than be tucked at all directions by competing ideologies, competing uh, thinking and so forth. It's great to have diversity of ideas, but having that diversity of ideas, we must then find convergence to help everyone move together. And that is why, to me, it is so important that in the education system, beyond the transmission of content, it is the inculcation of values and the building of character. A character that says that in Singapore, we don't define success just by what we achieve for ourselves, but we define success by also how we enable others to succeed and to do even better than us, especially the next generation. Thank you, Minister. Very well, very nicely put that, you know, this, uh, you know, we want to focus more on the student or the child as well as, you know, the progress uh, in, in your lifetime. But at the end of it all, despite your, uh, you know, or in spite of your successes, um, you know, the, the, our core values uh, still stand, right? And that what, that's what makes us uh, Singaporeans and that's what makes Singapore strong, right? So thank you, Minister, for uh, your time today, right? I'll hand the time over back to Samantha. 
Ladies and gentlemen, we have now come to the end of the session. On behalf of IPS, I would like to extend our sincere thanks to Minister and Ms. Yong for their time today. Thank you also to the audience for your active participation in the discussions. We hope that these are conversations we will all continue having after today. Just a reminder that this conference has been recorded and will be available on the online platform for two weeks. The next session, titled Transiting to the Digital, Green and Care Economies, How to Succeed in the Jobs Ahead, will begin at 11 a.m. Thank you, and we hope to see you later.